He knows this might be the last few moves of his world championship. Oh my god. You've probably already seen this clip by now. A defeated Yan Napomniachi looks at the camera as Ding Li Ren sits with his head down. A few moves are played before Yan eventually resigns, and Ding Li Ren is the world champion. But to better understand how this all happened, we need to go back in time. He is the world just champion! Well, 30 then drives it in! And they go ahead! Finish is Syria! Real Madrid are the European champions! With the streets of Madrid celebrating Real Madrid's Champions League victory over Liverpool, Eight men, on the other hand, were getting ready to play in one of the most important tournaments of their lives. The city was just two weeks off hosting something much, much different. The 2022 Candidates Tournament. An eight-men chess tournament that would determine who would challenge Magnus Carlsen for the coveted Classical World Chess Championship. However, going into this, the talk was not about who would prevail to face Magnus, but if they were even going to play Magnus. See, following his 2021 World Championship win, Magnus cited a lack of motivation as a concern for his upcoming world championship. It was believed by many that Magnus would only play if he got a certain opponent. And after Jan Napomniachi dominated his second straight candidates going undefeated and winning with the most points since the format was introduced, what everyone feared happened. Magnus Carlsen, as of about 30-40 minutes ago, has made it official to his sources and Chess24 tweeted about it that he is relinquishing the world championship title and has no interest in defending it. Historical reasons and, and, and all of that, I don't have any inclination to play and I will, and I will simply not play the match. With Magnus officially being ruled out of the tournament, Fide would take the candidates tournament runner-up as the other participant, Ding Li Ren. But the fact that Ding had even finished second in the candidates was a wild turn of events on its own. Due to many Chinese restrictions, Ding did not play many tournaments outside of China in the time period of the pandemic. This made it hard for him to qualify for the candidates because 6 of the 8 spots were given to players with top 2 finishes in Fide tournaments like the World Cup. Ding had missed the 2022 candidates due to his lack of play outside of China. Or so he thought. See, Sergei Karyakin, someone who had already secured a spot in the candidates, publicly supported the invasion of Ukraine on social media. This led to Fine banning him for competitive play for six months for a violation of ethics policies. This ban meant he would miss a very important candidates tournament, remove a strong competitor from the scene, and free up a slot for a new player in the candidates. The rule stated, the highest rated player who had not yet qualified would be added. Coincidentally, this happened to be Ding Li Ren, but there was just one problem. He hadn't officially played 30 rated games in the past year, a requirement that Fide demanded. Despite still being unable to leave China, the Chinese Chess Federation managed to organize three rated events in order to get Ding to a minimum amount of games. Finally, after completing his 30 games, Ding had, against all the odds, clinched his spot in the candidates. Despite beating the odds, his candidates got off to a very rocky start. Through six rounds, Ding was tied for last place in the candidates, with two out of a possible six points. He would pick up his pace after that with three straight victories in rounds 9 to 11. Oh my gosh. Ding, he smells blood. He has become the shark. He has become the shark in the second half of the tournament. I believe that people think Ding Li Ren can win every single game he plays. I actually, he resigns. I, he resigns. The game is over. Ding Li Ren in clear second place. And going into the 14th and final round of the candidates, Yan had already clinched it with 9 points and only 1 round remaining. Second and third place were Hikaru and Ding on 7 and 7.5 seven and points respectively. In a fitting turn of events, the pair were each playing each other in the final round. Neither of them could challenge for first place, but some uncertainty loomed over the match. A win or a draw would secure Hikaru the second spot in the candidates. And from a drawn position on move 33, Hikaru moved his bishop three times in a row, giving Ding a small advantage. After a brilliantly played endgame, Hikaru would resign on move 58. Hikaru unknowingly was just 20 moves away from his first world championship appearance. And in one of the least probable turn of events, Ding had made it all the way to the championship. Magnus' withdrawal loomed over the match. To some, the match was considered diminished due to it. Since the Chess World Championship title win in 2013, Magnus had been able to defend it four times consecutively, holding the title for nearly a decade. So when Magnus gave up his title, the legitimacy of the next holder was really put into question. 
Many believed Magnus could retain the title if he really wanted to, and tried to, which prompted a big shadow of doubt over this match. Former world champion Gary Kasparov echoed many of these doubts. Uh, look, um, I can hardly call it a world championship match. So for me, the world championship match should include the strongest player on the planet, and this match doesn't. I'm not here to comment on Magnus' decision, but uh, it's um, it's kind of amputated event. So um, and as you know, I had my own history with FIDE, so that's why I'm I'm not going to change my view about FIDE championship. So it's a pity Magnus is not there, and naturally the match between uh, uh, Napo and Ding, you know, it's a, it's a it's a great show anyway, but it's not a world championship match, you know. He was no stranger to world championships, having competed in five FIDE world championships. Despite all this experience, his first remained as one of the craziest and most influential world chess championships we have ever seen on the board. In 1984, a young and up-and-coming Kasparov managed to win the candidate tournament to challenge the much older and much more experienced Karpov. This match, however, had a distinct difference to all the previous ones. They played to a target number of wins, rather than a best-of series. In this case, the first person to win 6 games would be victorious. And this would prove to be a terrible blunder. After just 9 games, Karpov was up 4 to nothing. Many seemed to think that he would school the much younger Kasparov, but Kasparov would not go down without a fight. Kasparov fought for 17 straight draws before Karpov managed to steal his 5th win. They drew 4 more times before Kasparov managed to pull off his first win. 14 more draws later and Kasparov had managed to win games 47 and 48, bringing the score to 5 to 3. 48 games had never been seen in a world championship before, and it was taking a toll on the players. The match had lasted 5 months, and the mental fatigue both players were experiencing was noticeably dangerous. FIDE's president, Florencio Campiones, decided to cut it short despite neither player wanting to stop. Declare. That the match is ended without decision. The match was played the next year from scratch, but FIDE would never return to the first two format from that day on. Which brings us to today. Ding Li Ren and Yan Napomniachi would play 14 games to determine a world champion. Whoever finished with the most overall points would be crowned the world chess champion. Game 1 opened with a Rui Lopez what most players consider to be one of the most principled openings in chess. It's solid and safe. Neither player looked to take a risk early on as it might return costly in the long run. Both players made a few inaccuracies in the game, but Yan held the edge in the middle of the game. As Ding Li Ran began to run late on time, Yan played some inaccuracies and Ding managed to trade the queens down to an equal endgame. The two men agreed on a draw after 5 hours. In a post-game interview, Ding Li Ran would give an insight into his brain. How? What is your overall feeling after the game? Oh, I'm not happy. Oh, oh, no, I'm happy. I feel a little bit depressed. I just cannot... Uh, no, I didn't think about chess so much. I, my mind was very strange. Yeah, many memories, uh, feelings, also strange things happen. I feel a little bit maybe I'm or something wrong with my mind then <laughs> become maybe it can conclude by the pressure of the tournament and this would unfortunately foreshadow the future game two couldn't be any more different from game one with the white pieces ding was given the first opportunity to strike the first three moves were a standard queen's gambit, but things quickly took a weird turn. Ding pushed his pawn to h3, a move that had never been played in any master's databases before. This move threw everyone off, including Yan, as it can basically be seen as a waste of a move. This move served a single purpose, to confuse Yan into playing into a line that Ding had already mastered. And it worked, as Ding went up huge on time. But ultimately, Yan played incredible chess, and Ding Liren struggled to control his time once again. After Yan converted his advantage brilliantly with rook takes g5, Ding surrendered after just 29 moves and Yan struck first on the board. Ding had lost one of the shortest games in World Chess Championship history in disastrous fashion. Chess is more than just a game, it's psychological warfare over a board of 64 squares. 
The slightest of a psychological edge can cause a difference between winning or not at the World Championship, and Dig was struggling mentally to keep up with the pressure. Yan, on the other hand, seemed impenetrable. He showed no signs of slowing down and he was in full control after just two games, something he could not say after the previous World Championship. In 2021, Yan won the candidates to challenge four-time World Chess Champion Magnus Carlsen. In their championship match, the score was knotted after five games, until suddenly, after the longest match in World Chess Championship history, Magnus took the first win of the match. After this game, Yan would never recover. The next five games of the match would result in three Magnus wins and two draws, leaving Yan winless for a whole match. A meltdown that many said was characteristic of Yan. You know, th this is really a, a nice position to get Yan in because Yan is like a snowball. Okay, he, uh, he, if he goes downhill, he's gonna get bigger and bigger. Like he's like a, you know, it turns into an avalanche very quickly. An unfortunate turn of events which Yan was set to avoid this year. Game 3 saw it open with the Queen's Gambit, another very solid opening that was often played in high stake matches like this one. Interestingly enough, the position that had been reached after 17 moves had only happened once before in the databases. That game was played online the year prior by Ding himself against Giri, and on his home ground, Ding manages to get Yan right where he wants him and develops a small advantage. But Ding makes one slight inconsistency and loses all that advantage because Yan can now target that pawn on d5. After some back and forth, the players would make a repetition after only 30 moves played. What marked a great improvement for Ding showed a disappointing end to a great start of the game. Many noticed a greater attitude in Ding. He seemed to have relaxed a little and was not looking stressed. Ding opened game 4 by playing an English game. It followed a typical Fortnite's English game as expected. But at move 9, something interesting was noticed. Yan played an inaccuracy by moving his knight to f4. Yan played this move in 3 minutes, indicating that it was some sort of prep most likely. And there was only one game in a database that followed that exact set of moves. And it was played by none other than Grandmaster Richard Report in 2013. This is actually really important because Report was Dingley Ren's second for this championship. And he was on his team and helped him practice. Many believed that Yan had simply messed up his lines and was accidentally playing something that he shouldn't. This allowed Ding to develop a slight edge over Yan in the position, but it doesn't look like it's going to stand for long as his pieces stay on the board. Yan has an opportunity to barricade his pieces around his king and defend himself to squeeze out a draw. Instead, he allowed a trade of bishops and galloped his knight into Ding's position. This allowed Ding to gain a complete control over the board for the price of a rook for a knight. And at an evaluation of plus 3, Ding managed to brilliantly convert the endgame until move 47 where Yan had finally had enough. The match was level at 2-2. Gotham Chess encapsulated what many in the community felt after this match. And he has won. He, he, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It's 2-2. Two to two. It's 2-2. Two to two. Oh. It's match on. Dingley Ren started slow, but now the slate is clean. Two to two after four. The excitement around the match was building. Chess, when played perfectly, is always a draw. And the two best grandmasters in the world with months of preparation usually play near perfection. Out of the last five World Chess Championships, over 70% of matches finished in draws. The idea of having a World Chess Championship like this, where players throw haymakers at each other, was nearly unheard of. In fact, the last time a World Championship match had drawn less than 50% of the matches was way back in 2006. The fans were excited to see more drama unfold at the World Championships, and we didn't really have to wait for long. As Astana was hit with freezing temperatures and a snowstorm overnight, the World Championship match on the other hand was just warming up. Yan was not going down without a fight. And with the white pieces in game 5, he wanted to make that very, very clear. The game would start with a standard Rui Lopez opening, but it wasn't the moves played that caught the viewers off guard, but rather the time it took to take them. Through the first 22 moves, 50 minutes of Ding's time had elapsed. Meanwhile, on the other side of the board, Yan had spent a measly 6 minutes. Yan's preparation was elite, and it was very noticeable. With all this pressure, Ding elected to play a very uncomfortable setup with his knight and bishop, and all Yan had to do was push his pawns launching a monster kingside attack on Ding. 
After marching into Deng's position, his pawns in preparation were just too strong for Deng. And after 48 moves, a dejected Deng Li Ren resigned the game. Yan strikes back. Ding opened game 6 by playing d4 with the white pieces. To the surprise of many on the third move, Ding put his bishop on f4, choosing to employ the London system. Despite existing for over 140 years, the London system had never been used at a world championship match, as it had not been favorable at this level of the game. Although it was very solid, the London system relies on your opponent making a mistake. It also takes a lot of work to receive a slight edge over your opponent compared to other openings. The London has also developed somewhat of a reputation in the chess community for being a solid but very boring opening choice for many. Players will often end up with the same boring setup game after game after game. Even some of my early content was about it. <laughs> Regardless, the chat and the commentators loved it when the London system came out of the game. Yes, surely he's not going for the London system or any other things uh, associated to Knight F3. <laughs> yes, he does. He <laughs> oh, no. Oh, wow. no. oh no, oh no, oh <laughs> no, the London. Okay, I think half the viewership is already lost. Um, out of protest, a lot of viewers, you know, have uh, logged out of our broadcast. Everybody hates the London, but well, well. Yan took Ding out of his prep early by playing a lesser known line, Bishop F5. Ding managed to quickly build a strong position, but the common theme of time mismanagement lingered in this game too. In a tricky position after Ding's 27th move, Yan had an insane line to salvage this position. In this position, there was a way to relieve the pressure. Rook takes e5. How? Because after d takes attacking the queen and the bishop, black has an incredible resource, queen to d8. And if you take the bishop, queen d1, king h2, queen h5, and it's a draw. It's a draw by perpetual check. It's a draw. Why? Because if this, you stop guarding that and you lose the knight. So. Obviously that wouldn't have happened. But with Ding trailing on time as per usual in the previous games, Yan tried to apply pressure to Ding by playing a move in 5 minutes, giving Ding a sizable advantage. On move 30 with just 20 minutes of time remaining, Ding had to find some way to maintain his advantage till 40th move where both players would receive an additional hour of time on their clocks. And he managed to do so by blitzing Yan's king and growing his advantage before even reaching the 40th move. And on the 41st move, we got to see the pure brilliance of the World Chess Championship. Ding burned through 20 minutes of time to play the move d5 to what seems like an innocent move to everyone, including chess.com's engine in the livestream, was nothing short of genius. Ding was sending one of the most incredible mating nets around Yan's king. The order in which I can do it. I'm struggling as well, king h7. Is the deep one, yeah, is deep one involved? I don't think the deep one is involved, and I don't know why d5 had to be played for the this ding to work. <laughs> I don't see what the deep... It? Wait, he's closed a mating net, Anish. The king, oh wow, okay, we have to show this uh, on the board. I think I've come up with the idea. Let's okay, uh, yeah. jump in. Both players are away right now. I think he wants to sacrifice his queen, and d5 does contribute here. So, okay, there's a discovered check. We were assuming uh, king h7. Let's bring up the analysis board while Yan returns. And now knight g6, we were saying rook g8, but Anish, queen f7. And I'm going to take this and checkmate you. Oh, that's weird. Look at this. Okay, see, I'm not. Uh, this is not my strength. Checkmates. checkmates. I'm gonna start. So I'm bad at checkmates. Checkmating patterns. There is a video online also where a bunch of top players solve checkmates. It's, it's just not my strength. It's just very difficult. Oh, this is beautiful. Wow. And so this weird. is why the d4, d5 push contributes. You cover the e6 square. Cover the escape square. He saw this. What was it? Five, oh, six Jan moves in advance. It? Does Jan see it? On move 44, Yan would stop Ding's plans by resigning. One of the most memorable World Chess Championship games in recent times had concluded over the board. But it wasn't just done there. In a post-game interview, this happened. Why do you think there are more decisive games in this match than World Championship matches in the past? Ask me this question another day. Sorry? Ask me these questions like some another day. <laughs> Alright, we'll keep that. What about you, Ding? I guess the reason is maybe we are not that, that pr pr professional than Magnus. <laughs> A demonstration of both players' personalities that would ultimately go viral. 
To add to the storylines involved with this match, the contrast between the players was beginning to become noticeable. Healing from Russia, the pressure was on Yan to produce. For long, Russia has had the strongest chess players and heritage, dominating chess from the 1950s all the way to the early 2000s. They were in fact so dominant that I made an entire video on their dynasty. But recently, Russia has lost their grip on world chess. A Russian player has last won the world championships in 2006. And with Karyakin failing to close out his game with Magnus in 2016, and Yan's unfortunate 2021 championship, he had something to prove for both himself and his country. Thing on the other hand was not under as much pressure. Nationally, China had not accomplished much on the men's side. Ding was the first true elite Chinese chess player, and he was the first Chinese man to make it to the world championships. Matter of fact, classical international chess isn't even the most popular kind of chess in China. The more traditional Zhengqi variant is more popular in China. Yan was looking to keep Russia's dominance going, while Ding was just looking to send his country into the limelight for once. Their personalities also clashed on the board. As previously mentioned, Yan has a rather impatient nature and easily gets tilted often playing moves way too fast when he could have thought it through more. Ding on the other hand is the complete opposite, almost too patient, burning through time on easily findable moves where the options aren't as good. Two of the most talented chess players in the world with complete opposite paths, one involved in full dominance on his way to the world championship, and the other involved with many ups and downs to achieve the same feat. What was once presumed as a poor world championship had turned into a spectacular show for everyone. The players were nodded after six games. Yan opened game seven with a pretty normal move, e4, the most common first move in chess that could lead to various openings. Ding had previously been unsuccessful with e5, so Ding continued to shock the world with his openings by playing e6, the French defense. It had not been used in a world championship match since 1978 because it was a very difficult opening to understand. As early as move 4, Yan began to look uneasy over the board. He clearly was not ready for the French. Atypical to Yan, he started spending meaningful time on his moves in the opening. As he saw the opportunity to take the lead, Ding spent much time looking for moves and eradicated all time advantage he had built up from the opening. So much so, that at one point, Ding had 25 minutes to Yan's hour. Smelling blood in the water, Ding starts hunting for a win with the black pieces. After a myriad of exchanges in the center of the board, Ding is down a rook for a bishop and insanely active pieces staring down Yan's king. And by move 26, both players had merely 20 minutes remaining to reach the additional hour received at move 40. It was clear the game was about to unravel, and at move 32, with Ding pushing his initiative, Ding had 5 minutes to make 8 moves. To the shock of all chess fans alike, Ding froze at the board. He couldn't bring himself to play a move. With just 45 seconds remaining, Ding would finally make a move, but it was already too late. He started blitzing out moves to try and reach a time control on move 40, but by move 37, with just 3 seconds remaining, it was all gone. Ding resigned and it was official. The world championship had broken him. He was at an all time low, and the nerves that we saw early on seemed to be catching up to him. With the next day being a rest day, both players were looking to finally get some well deserved time off after what was one of the most tension filled matches in the world chess championship history. After a full rest day, the two players return to the chessboard for yet another clash. Ding opens with d4, and after the first couple moves, we find ourselves in a Nimzo Indian defense from Yan. A very edgy and modern opening that gives both sides a chance at winning. Ding would elect early to play a sideline playing pawn to a3. With both players fully in preparation, Ding would drop what he said was a cannonball of preparation with rook a2. An obscure idea among top grandmasters, which involves supporting your pieces on the second rank in the future when they move. On move 12, Ding brilliantly sacrifices Bishop for the activity on Yan's h-file. And at this moment, something match-breaking was happening. 
but it wasn't over the board. Over on the popular forum website, Reddit, something was brewing in the community. A Reddit post had just gone up. Someone closely following the game had noticed something interesting. Two random Lee Chess accounts created in mid-February, just one month before the World Championship, had played the exact same opening as Game 8 of the World Championship, move by move. Both accounts had 72 rapid games played, and they were exclusively played against each other. Their games followed the exact openings from games 2 and 8 of the World Chess Championship before it even started. They played very similar lines to Ding's ideas, including H3 as in game 2. Additionally, the F. Vitelli account also existed on chess.com, where it played 12 games exclusively against an account called Autumnstream, which self identified as Chinese. And Ding is Chinese, obviously. Fans believed to have found the training accounts belonging to Ding Li Ren and his second, Richard Report. The AutumnStreamChess.com account got banned on February 12th after boasting some insane accuracy scores. Almost as if it was the second best player in the world playing. And the day after, the two Lee Chess accounts were opened. After taking notice to what the internet was saying, the F. Vitali account changed his name to GG Why Not. Many were confident that these were training accounts for Dinger Report to practice long distance. Looking at all these openings, seeing the anti-Catalans, seeing these early H3s, which have already been played, seeing the, these Nimzo lines, which have also been played now in the World Championship match, there is no doubt in my mind, after seeing the London system as well, we've now seen three of the four three of the four um, openings that Ding has played in this in this match so far being essayed essayed in these online games between the two players. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is Ding Lorenz account. Ding lost possibly months of preparation due to this leak. There were lines of the Petrov and King's Indian on these accounts which Ding lightly had to scrap due to this. After the match, Ding would reveal that the leak left them with no real ideas and that they had to make up ideas as they were going. However, Game 8 was going on and neither player was aware that the leak went public. With the previous bishop sacrifice, Ding's attacking odds are looking promising. But for what seems to be happening every game, Ding is down by over 30 minutes to Yan, and on move 24, Ding finally manages to get a great advantage by, ironically, moving his rook on a2, which he placed there on the 9th move through his brilliant preparation. The stars were finally aligning for Ding. He had built a plus 7 engine advantage on the board. A couple of moves later, with Ding knocking on the door, Yan played queen h4, sacrificing a full rook for the possibility of repeated checks and a draw. Unbeknownst to Ding, Yan is just bluffing. Queen h4 is a bluff. Why? It turns out after queen d8, queen e4, rook e2, queen b1, king d2, queen b2, check here, check here. White is winning by sacrificing the rook, king to e4. And if queen c2, there are no more checks. I have never seen something like this. The brave king needs to walk into the center of the board like this. Queen takes d3 and there is queen f6, double queen, and the king is safe. This is sickening. But with just 24 minutes to do nine moves, Ding must have gotten a bit scared of repeating the horrors of game seven. And after just two minutes of thought, Ding fell for the bluff as he moved his king over to d1. All Ding has to do is guard his precious pawns and attempt to win some of Yan's pawns, but it's too late. Yan sacrifices his knight to win Ding's powerful pawn, and no progress can be made in the position after this. Trades are made, and a draw is finally agreed upon after 45 moves. Ding's elite rook a2 preparation was all for nothing. He let the plus 7 advantage slip right through his hands. Going on from now, Ding would have quite the uphill battle. Ding's success so far just couldn't be attributed to himself. The unsung hero in all of this is his second and training partner, Richard Report, who played a massive role behind the scenes. Report is known for his creative ideas and radical openings. Ding chose Report to be second because of this. His play also complemented Ding so well and made chess even funner for him. He even said, The main key has been my analyst, Richard Report. He has brought all the creativity that I was lacking with my openings. He was the mind behind the wacky openings that Ding had played, such as the London or the French. In fact, Ding had jokingly suggested the French before Game 7, to which Report insisted that Ding played it. Richard is not afraid to step outside the box to put Ding in advantageous positions. This was one of Ding's strengths up until now, and now the leak had put it all in jeopardy. 
He was down by a game in the match, and the very next day, Ding would have to survive with the black pieces and a lot of his theory lost. And the very next day, Yan played the Rui Lopez with the white pieces. The d3 bishop c5 position that had been reached after a couple moves had been on the practice accounts a couple of times. Yan started his attack early by marching his pieces dangerously close to Ding's king. Hanging by a thread here, one wrong move could lead to disaster for Ding. Apart from an exchange sacrifice which Ding offered on the 26th move, the rest of the game was rather peaceful considering the circumstances surrounding the previous 5. The Grandmasters traded their pieces down to a pawns and knight endgame. The endgame is a clear drawn position since black will just sacrifice their knight for white's extra pawn, and checkmates are not possible with just a knight and a king. Regardless, the pair played it out until there was no more progression remaining, and a draw was agreed upon. With Ding receiving the white pieces after a rest day, many were excited to see what he and Report had drawn up for our opening choice after the supposed leak. And for game 10, Ding brought back the English opening after its success in game 4. The game had started out with the men blitzing out moves of theory in mere seconds. After some shuffling of pieces, a huge trade happens in the center leaving basically an even endgame behind. And with Yan being up in the match, he proceeded to play defensively to which Ding could not break through on or create any counterplay whatsoever. And for the second time in World Chess Championship history, the players would trade down to their Bear Kings making a draw with just 4 games remaining in the match. Ding had to find some way to make up that 1 point deficit, and he was beginning to run out of time. Yan opened game 11 with his trusty Rui Lopez. Yan with the white pieces wasn't too bothered to chase a win with 3 games remaining after this and a whole point advantage and played a solid defensive game while Ding didn't want to overextend and possibly end his world championship on the spot. This led to possibly one of the tamest world chess championship games in recent history. With both players trading down to an equal rook end game, they would make a threefold repetition by move 39 indicating the fourth draw in a row after a just 100 minute game. Ding was running out of time. He had two more opportunities to secure a win with the white pieces in games 12 and 14, while Yan just had to squeeze out draws for the three remaining games. As the tension built up on whether Ding would manage to come back, it was very apparent that games 12 and 14 would be pivotal in deciding our world chess champion. Despite being in the rough spot he was in, Ding wasn't counting himself out. There are three games ahead, you know, in candidates I, I win on the last game, so anything can happen in the last three rounds. With Ding lightly to press for a win in a match, fans were eager to tune in to see what was going to be sort of a make or break moment for Ding. He started with d4 and knight f3. Oh, looks like we're going to have another London system is what everyone thought. Until Ding quickly sent the match into chaos by playing the Kola system to Jan's dismay. A rarely played at the top level chess opening developed in the 1900s. It is however a rather unambitious and passive opening which is not what Ding needed at this stage of the game. But just like in game 2, Ding is neglecting the main lines in order to get Jan out of his comfort zone. Both players were understandably nervous as the implications that this game would have on the overall result of the match was huge. Yan shocked the world on move 11 when Ding was threatening to take his knight and ruin his own pawn structure and cause long term weaknesses. Instead of preventing it as most players would do, Yan walked right into the fire by castling on the same side. This was the second time this match Yan had invited the doubling of his pawns, with the last ending in a Yan victory. As both players geared for a bloody king sign battle, Ding would play the first error of the match with bishop c2. This would be followed by Yan playing a perfect 7 move sequence to seize a minus 2 advantage on the board. Yan had built himself a fortress of defenses. Many began to ride off the world championship here as Yan had winning odds and Ding would have a steep mountain to climb if he couldn't find a miracle. 
and with his back against the wall, Ding seemingly gets a glimmer of hope, as Yan moved his rook to g8 instead of going for a seemingly free fork of the rooks on f3. At this point in the game, a swinging pendulum of inaccuracies was set off. Both Yan and Ding would take turns completely missing winning moves. In just a minute and a half, Yan played the move bishop b8, and all of a sudden Ding is winning. But then he plays queen b7, and now Yan is winning. Yan then misses an error winning move by playing rook h6, and we find ourselves in equality in the game. The magnitude of this game was clearly causing nerves in both players alike. The one who would manage to conquer its said nerves would likely become victorious from this game. And with both players running out of progressive moves with not much time remaining on their clocks, they agreed to a... what? They didn't draw? Yan played f5 a terrible move which the engine rates at plus 5 for Ding, sacrificing the e6 pawn and all shelter for his king. And Yan realized immediately that he'd thrown away his lead, walking away while swearing just to come back to put his head in his hands. He would spend the remainder of his time moping around and playing a couple moves before ultimately resigning. Ding had tied it up, and with just two games remaining, the slate was clean. A once written off championship was approaching its limits. Right in the wild match of yesterday, Ding looked emotionless and stoic compared to Yan's uneasy look. Being superstitious, Yan was now wearing a white shirt compared to the salmon colored one he was wearing for the past 6 rounds. All the signs pointed to Yan being under immense pressure to help keep his world championship hopes alive. With the world on his shoulders, Yan returned to the board to play his favorite opening this championship, the Rui Lopez. Both players had come prepared with the first 10 moves being played in exceptional time and resulting in a unique position never played at the master level. With a position that could accurately describe the series at the moment, the board was full of tension. Every piece staring down at each other with no captures being made. Yen will drop the first mistake by playing pawn to f3, and all of a sudden, Ding is pushing for a win with the black pieces. But with the initiative, Ding plays a move that perplexed most top players, rook to e5. Not working to move the powerful knight, but rather defending it. And with a trade of pieces, Ding is down a rook for a bishop and a pawn going into the endgame. For what looks like an exciting and interesting endgame coming up, well, both players didn't see it the same way, as they couldn't find any tangible ways to win without a huge risk, as they would repeat moves and make a draw. The world championship was going to come down to the final game. One game to decide the fate of both players. Their whole life's work was going to come down to a simple game, over a chessboard of 64 squares. On April 29th, the two men walked into St. Regis Astana Hotel, ready to crown a new victor of the world championship. If the dispute were to be unresolved, the players would have to go to a rapid time format. But it was now all in their hands. All the blunders, mistakes, and brilliancies from the past meant nothing now. A new match was about to start. Ding prudently opened with d4, and Yan responded with the Nimzo Indian defense. As the pair were gearing up to have yet another draw on the big stage, Ding signaled he didn't want such peace and started attacking with knight g5, later sacrificing the knight in order to get a very harmful attack on Yan. Yan easily manages to stifle Ding's attack, so much so that Ding had to spend 20 minutes thinking of a reply. After a trade of queens, the players remain on equal material with identical pawns, but Ding is down on time as per usual in the match. Looks like we're heading for yet another draw, until Ding voluntarily trades off a bishop to damage his own pawn structure, to which Yan grimaced to. And all of a sudden, Ding's position isn't looking too pleasant. As we approach the endgame, Ding's chances are looking slim. With lots of pressure on him, Ding plays King E2, a terrible move, allowing Yat to trade into a winning endgame. Ding plays King E2 and essentially loses the game. Stockfish doesn't even realize because it's on a low depth, but after the move Rook C3, Black is winning. Black is winning. Why is Black winning in this position? because of the threat of taking the bishop. For example, if the rook comes back, black wins. Rook d3 takes 
This should be five. Game over. You can defend the rook, but I'm gonna go take, 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 take. This is a winning endgame. Three pawns, four pawns. My king runs over here. You go win this pawn. I win the rest of the pawns. Not only do I win the game, I win the world championship. This is nuts. Rook c3 and Yan Yipomnishi is winning. And as if this world championship had not offered enough twists and turns, Yan doesn't find it. And instead, after Ding's check, opts to push his e-pawn. And with just three minutes left on the clock, Ding would find a brilliant sequence to drag both players into a forced rook and pawn endgame, while each reaching their extra hour of added time. Up a flank pawn, Yan's endgame hopes for a win were looking slim. Regardless, the two strung out the endgame and Yan put a valiant effort to break through, but Ding ultimately found a defensive resource to save the game by sacrificing his f-pawn, and the pair would agree on a draw after a grueling 90 move game. A winner could not be decided in 14 games. The World Chess Championship was going to go to tiebreaks. The pair would begin to play a best of four series of 25 minute games with 10 seconds added for each move. If no victor emerges from that, then they play a series of two 5 plus 3 games. And if that still doesn't solve anything, then they play that series again. And if there isn't a result by now, then they play sudden death 3 plus 2 blitz for the world title. Not to mention all these games were going to be played in one day. The opportunity was monumental. We as the fans were about to be treated to one of the biggest spectacles of the year. More time scrambles, less time to think, and even more blunders. Nerves were gonna play a central role here, and these nervous wrecks were about to enter a frenzy. Ding's patience and time-hungry nature would be a gigantic disadvantage the shorter the game got. Would he be able to adapt? Well, historically, he's won more than Yan in a rapid time format with 7 wins, 8 draws, and 6 losses. But if Yan can manage to bring it to Blitz, it could get very dangerous for Ding, as Yan holds a scary head-to-head -head advantage of 13 wins, 13 draws, and only 2 losses to Ding. Who would be able to stand the test of time? We were about to find out. As Ding drew the White King yesterday, he began with the White Pieces. He played d4, to which the players quickly entered a sideline with pawn c3. One queen sacrificed later, and we found ourselves in a drawish position with neither player really pushing for it. And Yan ends up forcing a draw with the black pieces after a repetition. After a short 10 minute break, the players return to the board. For the second tiebreaker game, Yan played what is basically routine for him now, the Rui Lopez. Yan had built himself a decent advantage out of the opening, which 5 time world champion Vichy Nan commented. Seems like Y has something to work with. But Yan played one wrong move, and it fizzled out to a near identical endgame to the previous game. Both players still played it out as the rapid aspect of the game still left room for error, but it still ended undecided. On his ninth game with the white pieces, Ding played an original opening, the ready. Ding wasn't looking particularly a fighting spirit in any of the tiebreak matches as he was in game 14, while Yan seemed to try and force draws with black so he could win with the white pieces and they trade down to a bishop and rook endgame. The key part of this is the fact that they hold opposite colored bishops, and endgames with opposite colored bishops often tend to lead to draws even when one side is up 1-3 to three pawns, because they can just create a blockade using their bishop which the other side won't be able to target due to theirs being on the opposite color. This tends to halt all progress in the positions and end up in a draw, and this game followed that exact same path. This was the third straight tiebreak draw. the winner of this game would win the whole world championship outright. If nothing was decided, we would go to Blitz where Yan held a considerable edge over Ding. And what else would Yan play but the Rui Lopez again? This one followed the exact same first 11 moves as game 16. But the stale, boring past 3 games were nothing on this one. Both players seemed to be playing moves indicating they wanted a decisive game. And Ding started gearing his pieces for a king same side attack with f5. But Yan defends masterfully, and at the end of all the exchanges, Yan finds himself up a pawn and 12 minutes to Ding 6. Yan quickly allows Ding to recapture, and we find ourselves in an edgy and hard to call endgame. 
Either side could really bring it home here. And with 90 seconds left on Dink's clock, we begin to see a repetition of checks from Jan offering a draw. And in front of a peak world championship viewership of over 570,000 across all of chess.com streams, Ding played the sensational Rook G6, signaling he wants a win, not a draw. The Rooks are traded off as Ding's pawns storm down the board. Both players had barely any time remaining. My goodness. And Jan Napomski, he sits shame. up in his chair, but he knows this might be the last few moves of his world championship. Oh my god. Oh, oh you see it. He, he, he gives knows. Up. He knows it. Now yeah, Bishop takes f four is easy. Not breaking. It's over! Ding Lurin is the world just champion! Wow! He has made history as the first Chinese player to win the World Championship. We see handshakes that Ding is overtaken by emotions. He And in the chaos of this historic time scramble, the new World Chess Champion had been crowned. Ding Li Ren. Against all odds, Ding got his first lead of the match in the last game completing one of the least probable World Chess Championship comebacks of all time. He wasn't even supposed to make it to the candidates, but he did. He wasn't supposed to make it to the championship match, but he did. Now, he had completed his immortal run, cementing himself in chess history. Chess is a sacrificial game, both on the board and off of it. 23 days of pure mind-numbing calculations, studying and stressing had concluded to crown Ding the victor, the path both players had taken to get here was brutally difficult, involving sacrifices along the way. But only one could emerge from the narrow path. But the weight of such a crown is nothing to scoff at. Apart from the Superbet Classic played by Ding 4 days after the championship, he would disappear for over 230 days not playing a single tournament and cancelling many appearances to said tournaments. Ding found it difficult to hold himself in such pressure-filled shoes. Taking a spot of possibly the greatest to ever do it was difficult. Not to mention the thousands online who didn't consider him a legitimate champion, belittling Ding's achievement as a product of luck rather than ability. But the truth is, every skillful thing in life takes some form of luck to make it happen. Success is always a combination of the right amount of skill and the right amount of chance, and Ding had made it happen with the cards he was dealt. He was never supposed to be in this position, but he adapted. While some of his success could be chalked up to luck, it would have never happened without his resilience. There was seemingly nothing at this stage that Ding couldn't overcome. There were multiple moments of despair where Ding looked like he was barely holding on for his hopes and dreams. He didn't lead the world championship until the very last game. He was written off in the candidates as he had a poor start. This is what ultimately separates Ding from the rest. He did what no one else could. He is and will be the world champion until proven otherwise. And many rushed to point out that Magnus Carlsen would have defeated Ding in said match if it took place, doubting the validity of Ding being the best in the world. And they can speculate all they want, but players will always be defined by the legacy they left over the board. History never remembers the ifs, the buts, or even the maybes. They remember the champions. <laughs>